Good morning. Good morning. This is the 20th Sunday after Pentecost. Uh, we'll follow the service printed in the service folder as usual. And during our sermon time, we're going to be reminded that uh, as believers, we will not die, but live eternally. So we ask the Lord to lead us in this time of worship and praise. And we'll begin by singing the hymn on eagle's wings. Again, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Dear friends, let us approach God with a true heart and confess our sins, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to forgive us. Lord of life, I confess that I am by nature dead in sin, for faithless worry and selfish pride, for sins of habit and sins of choice, for the evil I have done and the good I have failed to do. You should cast me away from your presence forever. O oh Lord, I am sorry for my sins. Forgive me for Jesus' sake. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. In his great mercy, God made us alive in Christ even when we were dead in our sins. Hear the word of Christ through his called servant. I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And in mercy, or in peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the well-being of all people everywhere, 
that they may receive from you all they need to sustain body and life. Hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the spread of your life-giving gospel throughout the world, that all who are lost in sin may be brought to faith in you, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ, have mercy. For patience and perseverance in this life, that we may not lose the hope of heaven as we await your return, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Lord of life, live in us that we may live for you. Amen. Amen. goodness keep us safe from every evil of body and soul make us ready with cheerful hearts to do whatever pleases you through jesus christ your son our lord who lives and reigns with you in the holy spirit one god now and forever Amen. you may be seated Our first lesson for this 20th Sunday after Pentecost is also our sermon text for today. It's from the Old Testament prophet Habakkuk, and it's chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, and then chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. And here the prophet complains about violence and injustice in his land, and the Lord answers uh, this and calls him to faith and promises that his promises will be kept. We read the oracle that Habakkuk, the prophet, received. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you, violence, but you do not save? Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Then the Lord replied, write down the revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false. Though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright. But the righteous will live by his faith. This ends our first lesson. And we'll now sing Psalm 27. <laughs> Hear my 
serve me. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in anger. You have been my helper. Do not reject me or forsake me. O God, my Savior, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? Of whom shall I be afraid? Though my father and mother forsake me, the Lord will receive me. I am still confident of this. I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now and will be forever. Amen. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Of whom shall I be afraid? Of whom shall I be afraid? The second lesson for today is from the second letter to Timothy. The First chapter, verses 3 through 14. And here Paul's thankful for Timothy's faith and urges him to continue to fan into flame that gift of God. We read, I thank God, whom I serve as my forefathers did, with a clear conscience as night and day, I constantly remember you in my prayers. Recalling your tears, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. I have been reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. For this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, of love, and of self-discipline. So do not be ashamed to testify about our Lord, or ashamed of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel by the power of God, who has saved us and calls us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. The grace, or this grace, was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. But it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. And of this gospel, I was appointed a herald and an apostle and a teacher. That is why I am suffering as I am. Yet I am not ashamed because I know whom I have believed and am convinced that he is able to guard what I have entrusted to him for that day. What you heard from me keep as the pattern of sound teaching with faith and love in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in us. This ends the second lesson, and we join the verse of the day. Hallelujah. I will proclaim your name to my people. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Hallelujah. Please rise for the gospel lesson. The gospel for today is from Luke's gospel. The 17th chapter, verses 1 through 10. In this section, Christ promises that faith can do great things, like offer forgiveness to someone who has sinned against us. Jesus said to his disciples, Things that cause people to sin are bound to come, but woe to that person through whom they come. 
it would be better for him to be thrown into the sea with a millstone tied around his neck than for him to cause one of these little ones to sin. So watch yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. If he sins against you seven times in a day and seven times comes back to you and says, I repent, forgive him. The apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. And he replied, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be uprooted and planted in the sea and it will obey you. Suppose one of you had a servant plowing or looking after the sheep. Would he say to the servant when he comes in from the field, come along now and sit down to eat? No, would he not rather say, prepare my supper, get yourself ready and wait on me while I eat and drink? After that, you may eat and drink. Would he thank the servant because he did what he was told to do? So you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. This ends the Apostle lesson. You may be seated and the children can come forward for children's sermon. lesson we just read, it talked about a mustard seed. You know how big a mustard seed is? Have you ever had a, a dinner roll or a... About the size of an apple seed? Uh, it's even smaller than that. Um, have you ever had a roll that has like little seeds on it? Sesame seeds? Have you ever had a roll like that? That's about the size of a mustard seed, like those little seeds are on a hamburger bun or a roll that you might have. That's the size of a mustard seed. And in our, our story, the gospel lesson, Jesus said, if our faith is only that big, we can do some tremendous things. We talk a lot about faith at church here. Faith in Jesus Christ. What exactly is faith? We'd say, if somebody asked you, what's faith? Do you have any answer to that? I'm going to show you something here. What do you think this is? A lemon? Any idea what this is? I forgot the name of it. Uh, would you believe me if I told you this was an orange? You wouldn't believe me? Or if very old. Very old? <laughs> Actually, the opposite is true, but if I showed you the inside of it, would you then believe me that it's an orange? Yes! Yeah, that looks like an orange, right? This is not a, an old orange. This is a young orange. Before they turn orange, they're green. I picked this from a tree in our yard in Florida before I came here when I was back home a week or so ago. You didn't believe me. You didn't have faith in me that when I said this was an orange. Uh, hopefully, uh, you'll trust me from now on that I'm going to tell you the truth. <laughs> I might tease you and so on at times, but uh, I'm going to tell you the truth. But more importantly than believing me, we need to believe in God and his promises. Uh, the promises that he gives us about our sins being forgiven but our Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he did for us. So uh, trust God. Trust him, have faith in him. If I would uh, put a rope on the floor here, do you think I could walk on that rope and keep a straight line? Probably. What about if I strung the rope up from the ro this roof to the next building's roof? Do you think I could walk on that rope when it's up in the air? No. Can some people do that? Have you ever seen a person, a tightrope walker? Yeah. Okay. A year or so ago, there was a guy who walked across the Niagara Falls on a tightrope. And that, I don't know if you've ever been to Niagara Falls. It's a big 
area going from the United States to Canada. He walked across above the falls on a tightrope. Uh, if you saw that, you think that guy could do it? If he was here, would you say, I believe you that you could do that? Would you have faith if you saw him on TV walking on that tightrope across Niagara Falls and he was here in person and he'd say to you, do you believe I can do that? Would you say yes? No. If you saw it on TV, you'd say yes. What if he said to you, I'm going to do it again next month and I'm going to be pushing a wheelbarrow in front of me and I want you to ride that wheelbarrow? Oh, because there are two wheels. Two wheels? Okay. <laughs> Well, you, you'd back off from that. You wouldn't quite go along with that. But really, that's what faith is. Faith isn't just saying, Jesus, I know you, you went to the cross. You died for my sins. It's our putting ourselves into his hands, riding that wheelbarrow through our life here. So faith, it's important. How, how do you continue to have faith in Jesus? By reading the Bible. Reading the Bible. This uh, orange grew on a tree. How'd that tree grow? What does it need to grow? Water, Water good weather, warm weather, sunlight. Yeah, sunlight. There are things it needs, just as your faith needs to be watered. You were watered during your baptism. You continue to need to be fed. The sunshine, S-O-N, Jesus, God's son, is what you need. So. Remember, faith isn't just saying, yes, Jesus is my Savior. It's knowing that it's a powerful thing, that faith we have. So build on it. Be thankful for it. Amen. You can go back to your seats, and we'll continue the next hymn. Be still, my soul. Be our. 
text that we're going to meditate on this morning is the one we heard in the first lesson. I won't read it again now. It will be referred to uh, as we go through the sermon. Fellow Christians, how confident are you that you're going to make it through this day? Or that you're going to make it through this week? Or this month? Or this year? How confident are you? Do you feel indestructible? Do you feel that you're not going to die? You've got a lot of years left ahead of you. Well, take a look at the obituaries. And what do you see there? You see a number of people that are maybe even younger than us. People about our age. They maybe were very confident uh, few days or a day or a few hours before they died. And we need to realize that when God summons us from this earth, we don't know, it could be at any time. But in the same regard, we should be confident. We should be bold, not arrogance. We know that, yes, we might die an earthly death at any time, but we know, more importantly, that we're going to live eternally. Christians should be rather confident and bold knowing that the Lord has promised them eternal life. Now, that doesn't mean that there aren't going to be problems along the way as we go through this earth. Our text talks about some troubled times. The prophet Habakkuk was experiencing some things in his life, in his country, in his world that weren't very pleasant. Habakkuk was a prophet. When we think of prophets, we think of someone who relays God's word to God's people. And that's true. But a prophet also would relay things from the people to God. Approach God on their behalf. And in our text, we see Habakkuk doing both. Uh, going to God from the people and going to the people from God. Habakkuk was very aware of current events and they weren't so good. And yet our text is a statement that tells us, be patient, be confident, you will not die but live. Looking at his current events, clear he was living in a time of wickedness, a time of unbelief. And this was a problem not just in foreign lands elsewhere, but it was a problem right there in the southern kingdom of Judah. People were rejecting God's promises, ignoring God, and being idolatrous. And so on behalf of the few believers in Judah, Habakkuk goes to the Lord and he says to God, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you violence, but you don't seem to care? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are there before me. There is strife and conflicts abound. Yes, Habakkuk was very aware of what was going on. In fact, he uses 
six different words here to describe how bad things were. He says injustice was around and wrong and destruction and violence and strife and conflict. All of these things were going on completely unchecked in Judah. As far as Habakkuk could see, these things would continue and they would probably only get worse. And so he says to God, how long and why? Then the Lord responded through the prophet. He said, look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed. I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe even if you were told. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people. God replied that he was going to send the Babylonians, also known as the Chaldeans, to completely destroy Judah for the wickedness that was in the land. God was going to use this foreign nation to discipline his people and to lead sinners to repentance. But Babylon was actually even more wicked than the people of Judah. So Habakkuk wasn't real pleased to hear this. One of the reasons that he lamented about this message is because from all outward appearances, it seemed that the righteous, the believers, would be destroyed by the Babylonians along with the unbelievers. Babylonians didn't care. They were just out to conquer Judah. They didn't care if they killed believers or unbelievers. So Habakkuk cried out, O oh Lord, are you not from everlasting, my God, my Holy One? We will not die. Would God allow his chosen people to die? The people he had chosen as the people through whom the Savior would come into the world? The people he had set aside, the people he had protected in the desert and preserved as a nation. For if God's people died, God's promises would also have died with them. Would God let his promises fade away? Habakkuk didn't think so. He didn't believe so. Now does Habakkuk's cry sound familiar? Have you ever said, how long, O oh Lord, are you going to... Uh, Allow the problems in my life to continue? How long will you let sin and wickedness spread like fire in this world? How long will your faithful people be forced to suffer ridicule, maybe even persecution, and maybe even death? And how long will your call for repentance maybe natural disasters and acts of terror, how long will those calls to repent go unheeded by the world and yet fall on the righteous as well as on the wicked? Oh Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, we will not die. Really? It looks like we will. And the evidence says that uh, maybe we should. The evidence says that fewer and fewer people believe in the one true God today. The evidence says that those who do believe will be attacked and tempted and persecuted. And yes, throughout the world, there are Christians even killed for being a Christian. It looks like we will die, and it seems that we should die. God has made it clear from the beginning that the one who disobeys will die. It wouldn't take us very long to find out that the same thing that causes all the wickedness and violence that we see in the world, that stuff that we hate so much, that same thing can be found in us. Now, right here among us and in us, we see the greed at times that can lead to theft. We see the lust at times that can lead to adultery. We see the hatred at times that can lead to, to murder. And when we cry out violence and injustice, those cries can be directed at us on occasion too. 
It looks like we will die, and it seems like we should die. But the prophet then goes on and says some amazing things, some bold things. He says something contrary to what seems to be what was in store. He says, my God, my Holy One, we will not die. Now, that's not an arrogant cry of a youthful person who doesn't know better. It's not the cry of one who has yet to be enrolled in the school of real life. The prophet says, we will not die because he knows that God will not let his promises die. He knows that God has something to say. And so he goes on, I will stand at my watch and station myself on the ramparts. I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. Habakkuk knew that the Lord would answer and so he waited for a word from God about the certainty of life. Then the Lord replied, write it down, write down this revelation and make it plain on tablets so that a herald may run with it. I just seen the word herald, my middle name is Harold, so whenever I see that name, I think, well, he's talking to me personally there. So anyway, a herald will run with it. Now Habakkuk had something that he could say to the people of Judah. God had spoken. He gave to Habakkuk a word that was so important that it had to be written down permanently and clearly. It had to be clear so people could understand it. It had to be permanent because it applied to the future. And here are the words. For the revelation awaits an appointed time. It speaks of the end and will not prove false, though it linger, wait for it. It will certainly come and will not delay. The revelation, the, the word of God, spoke of a time that was yet to come. And what did it say? Referring to Babylon, really, it says, See, he is puffed up. His desires are not upright. Even though it seems like wickedness prevails, God said, even though the Christians, the believers, are threatening to be destroyed, or threatened to be destroyed, God knows that what they do, the Babylonians, what they do is wicked. And God will punish sinfulness with death. But the righteous one will live by faith. There's the good news. The righteous will live by faith. Here's truth. Here's, here's life. It comes by faith. It comes by believing the promises of God and the promises of God that at times can seem so far away, so impossible. And those who believe these promises receive what the promises say. And they say that God would send a Savior, a man who would live in place of us all. They say that the Messiah would suffer and die and rise from the dead would suffer and die in our place. They say what Paul wrote to Timothy in the second lesson we heard today, that God saved us and called us to a holy life, not because of anything we had done, but because of his own purpose and grace. This grace was given us in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior, Christ Jesus, who has destroyed death, and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. So we live because the gospel promises life with God. Life now and life forever. We will live because the promise of the gospel comes to those who believe those promises. Of course, that doesn't mean that we'll never face hardship or danger or persecution. It doesn't mean that we won't face a the earthly death of our body, those things will come. But this word from God tells us that through these things and in spite of them, we will live. It was the writer in Psalm 118 who first said those words, I will not die but live. But you'll notice that those words came at a time which seemed like death was a real possibility. Psalmist wrote, in my anguish I cried out to the Lord. The Lord has chastened me severely. 
Martin Luther loved to go back to those words. He used those words and was very comforted by them. He found them especially comforted when he found himself an enemy of the state, an enemy of the church, when he found himself wrestling with the devil. We will not die but live. We say that not because confidence is so great, not because we have done something to increase our faith so that these things must happen. We say that because our faith is based upon the promises of God, based on words that will not prove false. Words such as, your sins are forgiven, or I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Or take and eat and take and drink. This is my true body and my true blood. True body and blood of our Savior, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. So when your faith feels smaller than a mustard seed, when you feel weak, you can then say, I've been baptized. My faith is a miraculous gift of God. When sinfulness and wickedness and injustice and cruelty affect you and your sins weigh heavily on your heart, you can say and know, I am forgiven. As the world grows more dangerous, as fighting and conflict in the world seems to be growing more and more intense, then we can still say, I will not die, but live. You can say that with absolute confidence. And this absolute confidence brings absolute comfort. We will not die but live. These words are not spoken by arrogant people who are unaware of the realities of life. They're spoken by people like you and me. They're spoken by people who know very well what life is, who know the dangers of this life all too well both spiritual and physical dangers. They're spoken by those who know their Savior. They know our God is faithful, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They know his word is true. So really, be patient, knowing that we will not die, but live. Amen. Please rise. We'll continue by confessing our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed on page 11. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated and will receive your offerings. Thank you. 
please rise for prayer. And we'll join in the prayer of the church on page 12. O Lord, our God, you are wise and powerful and good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. We praise you for every grace and blessing. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our mysteries and offerings to extend your healing and your hope. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, and local governments. Grant us civil servants who are worthy of honor and respect. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Help us find satisfaction in all work well done. Invigorate the, souls of the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your created order. Let us excellence. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us, Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. And we offer a special prayer on behalf of the call that has been uh, given to have a new pastor come here. Lord Jesus, you instituted the office of the public ministry and have given your people the privilege of extending calls to serve us through that ministry. Having asked for your help and guidance, our congregation has called Pastor Joel Tomford to serve us here at Tree of Life. We ask that as he prayerfully considers this call, you would guide him to a decision that is in the best interest of your kingdom. As we await his decision, bless our congregation and its ministry that your kingdom may continue to grow and flourish among us. We ask this in your name, for you are the good shepherd and the head of the church. And also hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Amen. We join in praying. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to you. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, <coughs> Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who has called us to be his own so that we may live under him in his kingdom and serve him in everlasting righteousness, innocence, and blessedness. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. Who in God 
Christ on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying take and eat this is my body which is given for you do this in remembrance of me then he took the cup gave thanks and gave it to them saying drink from it all of you this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me the peace of the Lord be with you always. and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for all your sins. Take and eat. This is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for all your sins. blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Take and drink. May the true body and blood of the Lord strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ given into death for all your sins take and eat this is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ 
given into death for all your sins. Take a drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ shed for you for the remission of all your sins. Take and drink. This is the true blood of our Lord. Shed for you for the remission of all your sins. May the true body and blood of the Lord strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given into death for all your sins. Take a drink. This is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the remission sins. Take and drink. May the true body and blood of the Lord strengthen and preserve you in the true faith unto life everlasting. Depart in peace. Amen. Continue with the song of Simeon. taste of the heavenly banquet that you have given us to eat and to drink in this sacrament 
Through this gift, you have fed our faith, nourished our hope, and strengthened our love. By your Spirit, help us to live as your holy people until that day when you will receive us as your guests at the wedding supper of the Lamb, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. And the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. May be seated for the closing hymn. I also would uh, excuse the confirmation students at this time. You can go back to uh, your room and be ready for my arrival soon. <laughs> uh, we'll continue with the closing hymn. <laughs> says there uh, another date is October 26th. So there will be a second work day. Okay, well again. It says whatever doesn't get done, yeah. Because normally we do